Go ahead, please. The Australian Open revels in the nickname of the Happy Slam, but given its place in the calendar, might it also be called the Springboard Slam? Certainly some have used victories in Melbourne as a base camp, a platform to scale heights that had previously seemed out of reach. Take 2016 women's singles champion Angelique Kerber. She had won seven of the lower level tour events since emerging as a surprise US Open semi-finalist in 2011. But on the biggest stage, success eluded her. When Kerber arrived in Melbourne in 2016, it was a seventh seed, but she had reached just one Grand Slam quarter-final in her previous 13 attempts. Indeed, she almost fell at the first hurdle in Australia, saving a match point on her way to beating Misaki Doi. Had that gone differently, who knows how Kerber's year might have panned out. Instead, she stunned Serena Williams in the final to become the first German Grand Slam winner since Steffi Graf 17 years earlier. My whole life I've been working really hard and now I'm here. Now I can say I'm a Grand Slam champion and it sounds really crazy. Kerber gave a little insight into her new mindset after the final when she said, The biggest thing I learned in these two weeks? To go for it. Of course, you will have some losses in your career as well, and also tough moments still, but you must believe that you can do it. I learned that in these two weeks. Suddenly, the Majors became a less daunting prospect. She reached the final at both Wimbledon and Flushing Meadows that year, losing to Serena in London, but beating Karolina Pliskova in New York for a second Grand Slam crown. In between, Kerber also claimed a silver medal at the Rio Olympics and closed out the year as runner-up at the WTA Finals in Singapore and world number one at the age of 28. Victoria Azarenka also saw her career move to a higher plane after victory in Melbourne in 2012. Her platform was built during 2011 when she reached her first Grand Slam semi-final at Wimbledon and was runner-up at the WTA Finals. With 2012 being an Olympic year, she saw it as an opportunity to join the game's elite and emulate her idol Steffi Graf, who achieved the Golden Slam in 1988. Her victory at the Australian Open propelled Azarenka to world number one, and she backed it up with tour titles in Qatar and at Indian Wells. Azarenka couldn't match Graf's heroics, but did come back from London with two medals, a bronze in the singles and gold in the mixed doubles alongside Max Mirny. She then reached the US Open final. In total, Azarenka won 87% of her matches and collected more titles in 2012 than in her previous two seasons combined. She retained her Aussie Open title in 2013 too. For Stan Wawrinka, winning in Australia meant more than just a first Grand Slam title. It was about emerging from Roger Federer's shadow. In 2014, he beat Rafa Nadal, a man he had never taken a set from in 12 previous meetings, to not only lift the Norman Brooks trophy, but also move above Federer to a career-high world number three, making him the Swiss number one for the first time. Vavrinka then came from a set down to beat Federer in Monte Carlo to win his first Masters Series title. He then teamed up with Federer to help Switzerland win their first Davis Cup later that same year. Famously, Novak Djokovic's second Aussie Open title sparked his phenomenal 2011 campaign, which began with a 41-match unbeaten streak until May's French Open semi-final. He cleaned up at Wimbledon and the US Open too, won five Masters titles and went to world number one for the first time in that July. By the end of the year, he'd won a record $12.6 million in prize money. Djokovic was, of course, well established, but the Australian Open can also be a launch pad for a whole career. By the end of 1996, 16-year-old Martina Hingis was already a top 10 player, having reached the US Open semis and the final of the year-ending WTA Tour Championships. Everyone knew she was on the verge of a massive breakthrough, and at the Australian Open, she proved it. Going in as fourth seed, she did not drop a set the entire tournament and became the youngest woman to win a Grand Slam since 1887. Her cause was aided by the absence of reigning champion Monica Seles and that eight of the top ten seeds crashed out of the tournament before the quarterfinals. But her run was masterful and she finished with a flourish, dispatching the unseeded Mary Pierce 6-2, 6-2 in 59 minutes. The New York Times declared, The future has risen. It's Hingis. 
describing her as having the precision of a Swiss clock and the temperament of a piranha. A mischievous Hingis, having also won the women's doubles, said afterwards, next time maybe I'll play mixed doubles so I can win that too. She waited until 2006 to do that, but dominated the rest of 1997. She reached the French Open final and then won both Wimbledon and the US Open, beating a 17-year-old Venus Williams at Flushing Meadows. She also won three of the biggest tour titles and won 71 out of 76 matches all year. The future had indeed risen, and it rose in Melbourne.